My name is Peter Shive, S-H-I-V-E. Oh. <laughs> um, I came here in 1969, so something like 46 years. Most of that was in geology and geophysics. It's uh, a kind of a research scientist, the early part of my career. And then at about age 50, 55, I changed my spots and started teaching um, more right brain type courses. So I've had a, I'm sort of a dilettante. I, I do a, a number of different sorts of things. Right, I, I teach a course called Wyoming Walkabout, which is uh, kind of giving people a sense for what it feels like to be Aboriginal Indigenous. Uh, but I do that with um, a friend of mine named Paul Taylor, and if he's not available, it's not a course I would teach. I, another course I teach is called The Consciousness of Nature, which is a literature, philosophy, poetry seminar in the way in which um, humans' attitudes towards the natural world have evolved as the human species has evolved. And then the course that I think we'll talk about in more detail today, since it's the one I'll be teaching um, in the, this coming fall, is called uh, Chaos, Fractals, and Complexity. It's a, uh, about uh, new sciences. I have a PhD in geophysics. I was an undergraduate in geology. Actually, I had three majors. I was a physics major, and then for three years I was an English major, and then uh, I became a geology major at a small liberal arts college, Wesleyan University in Connecticut. And then I went to Stanford in California, got a PhD in geophysics, did a postdoc there, and then came here. Well, I love being associated with an academic institution just because all of the things that are going on that one can take part of. But I think mostly for me, I love being, I love working with people who are trying to learn new things because it keeps me wanting to learn new things also. And at age 73, that's something that I, I, I want to work on. That association with, with people in classes, all things going on, people learning things, it's just exciting for me. Always has been. <clears throat> Depends on the type of class, of course. The uh, consciousness of nature, for example, is a kind of a seminar style class where mostly I'm a kind of a devil's advocate where I feed students questions, try, try to provoke them, rile them up, and, uh, and get a lot of response from the students. But the chaos class is kind of a throwback type of class, more of a standard old-fashioned lecture type course. Um, you really can't chat your way through chaos, fractals, and complexity with the heft that I want to, to get to in a semester. So it's mostly a, a lecture course. I'll ask a few questions on the way. But it doesn't depend as much on uh, response in class as the other kinds of classes that I teach in honors. Um, that's, that's the, so it's a, a three day a week, 50 minute type course. Well, I should say a little bit about the motivation of the class. I, I actually designed the class about 15 years ago when, when I had a goal. I wanted to teach mathematics to students who thought they hated it or who thought they stunk at it. And I realized that if you have a goal like that, what you have to have is material that is not boring. Uh, it has to be 
uh, provocative, counterintuitive, paradoxical in such a way that that students, even if they hate math, they're interested in the material. So this this body of of subjects includes oh maybe t 20 or more different specific categories. So you're not hammering on one thing for a long time. If somebody if somebody happens not to like something in the class, then cheer up, you know, and in a couple lectures we'll be talking about something that's completely different. Um, so it's mathematically driven, but the level of mathematics is is not high. It's nothing above algebra. Well, I should say there's there's imaginary and complex numbers, but I don't assume any background there. I start talking about those animals from scratch. Um, in the in the grading of the class, homework counts 50%, and I encourage students to work together, come in and and work with me. I've got, you know, I'm retired, so I have nothing but time. I can spend lots of time with any student who needs to be brought up to speed. So there's a homework set every week. Um, I make it a point to, to get them back graded in the next class period, so you get rapid feedback. There are two-hour exams, of which together count 25% and a final exam that counts 25%. There's, so, in addition to the lectures, after we've been going for about three weeks, we do, we do go to a computer lab where students run, run programs that I've written to look into certain aspects that you wouldn't want to have to try to work out with a pencil and a paper because you would die a slow death trying to do that. But um, students don't need to know anything about programming. In fact, I find nowadays that most students know more about how to run things in the computer lab than I do. So I don't think anybody would. would I, I find it a welcome break from the lectures, and I think the students probably do also. How to? Much, much more. I, I depend almost not at all on, on rote uh, memory of things. I'll often tell students or remind them of, of certain facts or numbers that, that they should have remembered, but gosh, you know, they slipped their mind. It, what's important is to know how to, to solve a problem. So, it's, it's learning how to problem solve using mathematics mostly. The other thing I, I'd like to say, you know, you hear this, these words, chaos, fractals, and complexity, and most people draw a blank. I, I, I want to say, I don't know whether you're going to ask me about that, but I want to talk a little bit about what those words mean uh, in brief. Uh, the order of the class actually is fractals first. Fractals first, then chaos, then complexity, because they build on each other in a logical way. Fractals is a story about pattern and shape, the way shapes fill space. In particular, patterns which have the property that, that as you magnify them, they continue to have a similar degree of detail, uh, even under infinite magnification. So. Uh, one buzzword that students have often heard is the Mandelbrot set. That's a classic fractal pattern. Chaos is a story mostly about time and the way in which the present ravels, or the past ravels into the present and then unravels into the future. Um, and we're talking about processes that are fundamentally unpredictable, like the weather. Unpredictable long range, the weather, um, human behavior, love, war, things like that, the stock market. 
and complexity is a story of space and time together. And um, it has a lot to do with the emerging field of artificial intelligence. We talk about things called cellular automata and neural net networks, which are really kind of like playing a game. That's, that's how we approach that part of the course. Because, well, the first exercise I give my students is to go to a search engine and type in any, anything they're interested in, like sports, and then slash chaos theory, or history slash complexity. And you will almost invariably be amazed in how these three new disciplines are becoming more and more important than just about anything you care about. Here's a good example. Over the years, I have had more students from the art department take chaos, fractals, and complexity than from any other department. Mostly these artists are interested in the creation and encryption of image. Um, and if you've looked into the Mandelbrot set, you know that, that fractals can be beautiful. Artists want to know. Oh, another thing that artists often care about is how can, is there some way that you can quantify beauty? Some people think that it might be possible. Um, I'm not going to commit myself here. So um, what I'm saying is that, that um, There should be great mention of chaos, fractals, and complexity in just about any discipline, any major at the university. There isn't yet, but it's starting. It's, it's huge in biology and zoology. It's huge in engineering. Um, so I think that, that um, you know, any student who, who learns this material is going to find a lot of application for it in just about anything they might care about. I once taught a class for the Albuquerque community. There were just a bunch of people. They had formed a chaos club, and they wanted to know, what about this? Well, I taught this class. We met weekly for a semester, once a week at night. And I had housewives, a couple of physicists came down from Los Alamos, guys that worked at gas stations, a few students. There was a young woman whose, whose interest was in the design of logos, and she thought that she could use this to do it. The most fascinating student I had was a guy who said to me, Peter, he said, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, to commandeer my friend's computers when they go off for a month and I'm going to program it so that it can do a zoom into the Mandelbrot set to 10 to the 98th power. And then I'm going to look to see patterns nobody's ever seen before. And when they are um, arrestingly beautiful, I'm going to get a laser printer and print these patterns on hot air balloons and sell them to rich people. <laughs> I don't know if he actually ever did that, but I thought it was a fascinating story. We could spend hours, you know, I could give a week's lecture on this, but I think I will mention one man who was a professor of mine when I was an undergraduate. His name was Joe Webb Peoples, and he was the chairman of the geology department there. And when I switched as a junior into geology, obviously I was non-standard. I needed somebody to understand where I was coming from and look into my life and um, give me some things that I needed. And he did that. And I would say that Joe is the reason why I teach in honors now. I remember I said that I was an undergraduate at a small liberal arts college. And so there was opportunity, small classes, interested faculty, 
faculty could could understand and know their students well enough to make significant differences in their lives. Um, I see the honors program here as a microcosm of a small liberal arts university or small liberal arts college within the larger university. So we have the ability to do here the kinds of things that Joe could do for me when I was an undergraduate there. That's why I'm here. You know, I want to get to know my students, and uh, um, I would say Joe. If, if Joe hadn't existed, it's quite possible that um, I could have lost my way. I was on academic probation. I was not happy. I couldn't find a major that, that really turned me on. And he fired me up and got me primed to, to go on and, and live a life and have a career that uh, 